take your Bibles, Acts chapter 15. We're going to have a teaching time tonight on the first doctrinal controversy of the church. The first major doctrinal controversy and how they worked through this. So we're going to read, you could read all of these verses from one down all the way, but we, we don't, we're not going to read down to verse 35, but we're going to read Acts chapter 15. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5, and then we'll read other scripture as we go along. The first doctrinal controversy of the church. Doctrine matters, and something very important is at stake in this first doctrinal controversy. The stakes are, are very high, because if they don't take a stand, at this moment, they're going to lose the gospel. They're going to lose the power of and the truth of the gospel through which people are going to be saved. So how high are the stakes? The stakes are high because the gospel's in the balance. Don't let anyone tell you that doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine matters because the doctrine is the teachings of God. And if God teaches us something, or if God teaches something, that matters. Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except we be circumcised, ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phineas and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. And let's, let's read verse 5 together. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so this is a major controversy. The gospel is at stake. Let's pray. So, Lord, teach us to stand for truth with humility and dignity and under your submission. And yet, Lord, to stand courageously as Paul and Barnabas and even Peter and James do during this time where the gospel is at stake and under attack. So, Lord, please work now in this time, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a few different angles I, I'm going to go at here tonight. I hope I don't, like, confuse you. But one of the things also that I see as a theme through this chapter and actually throughout the book of Acts is that the whole church is involved in the decision-making processes where important things are at stake. So we practice what we call a congregational form of government, and that is not based on tradition, but it is rooted, we believe, in the scripture. And we see, and I have them here, we're not going to look at all these, but I have them on your notes. And if you wanted to do a study on these, look up each of these scriptures, and it's very interesting, where there are at least these 16 New Testament examples of church decision making where the whole church is involved. And so what we want to see tonight also in this controversy over doctrine, it's not just the apostles who, who know sound doctrine and who are standing and making the decision on what is true. It's the whole church. So that means you have as much responsibility to maintain true doctrine in this church as I do. It's a church matter that we stand strong on the truth because the church makes the important decisions. So, I don't know 
what I just did there. Oh, here we go. Just so, so here are some of the ways that the whole church made decisions. I'm just going to list them. In electing officers, Acts 6. Commissioning and sending missionaries, Acts 13. Providing accountability and ministry efforts, Acts 14. Handling of finances, Acts 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 16. And disciplining its, its own church members. Remember, it says tell it to the church. So these are, these are just a few examples where the whole church is involved. So we'll see that tonight as the church deals with this matter of this doctrinal controversy. When it comes to controversy, do you like controversy? Do you, are you naturally drawn to confrontation? I personally am not. I, I, I don't like controversy. I like peace. <laughs> I like to be able to get along. I like when everybody's united and everybody agrees. But on the other hand, while we don't see controversy, we don't desire to be argumentative, right? But we have to stand for the truth. And ultimately, being a Christian is being called to controversy because we believe something that is true. And the devil will always attack the truth. And so we're living in a world system that hates God. And so we're not living in a world that everybody's going to agree with us. Now, we're lo not looking to argue and be in controversy with people. And, but we have to remember that there's going to be some level of, of controversy in being a Christian because we st we're going to stand for the Bible. Now, so that's important because sometimes Baptists, we're famous for this, you know. But there's the old saying, let's be like a Baptist church and split some Baptists get so convicted about certain things that are minor and they divide over minor issues. So that's why we have to know what are the major issues and fight for those. And sometimes we do have to, and even in this situation, some might even say that while they stood for the gospel and would not compromise the gospel, they did make a compromise in order to understand cultural differences. So it's actually an amazing test case for dealing with controversy, not compromising, but maybe comprom uh, compromising where something is not essential uh, to, the, to the gospel. Okay, so let's, I was just gonna look at this in three parts. One is the dissension and we read these verses one through six. So what is the dissension? It centers upon circumcision. And they say what? In order to be saved, you have to be circumcised. So Paul's, Paul's going out there preaching in, you know, in Galatia, in this first missionary journey, a lot of these people were, were pagan, coming out of paganism. And they weren't being circumcised, but they were believing in Jesus. So according to the, the, this group saying, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 1 and verse 5. They were saying it was needful to circumcise them. So these people who had believed in Jesus, if they weren't circumcised according to these, this group of, of teachers, and they were they're called often Judaizers, Judaizers, say it with me, Judaizers should understand that because the whole book of Galatians as well is really written to Judaizers who were seeking to bring this false doctrine into the church. So Paul actually writes the book of Galatians to com combat the same error that salvation will only happen to those who first become Jewish. You have, you, before you come to Christ, you first have to come to Moses. Before you come to Christ, you first have to get circumcised and become Jewish. And then you become a Christian. Paul says, no, you go straight to Jesus. Right? That's something important at stake here. So, except you be circumcised. It's needful. Remember Jesus said, you must be, what did he say? You must be born again. In other words, it, and he, it's the same word. If you look at verse 5, the Pharisees said it was needful or it was a must. It's the same word. In other words, Jesus said you must be born again. 
these Judaizers are saying, you must be circumcised. <laughs> or you're not saved. You know, religious people, even people who say they're Christians, are often quick to judge other people and their salvation. Even in church. Oh, that guy's he's not saved. He did that. Oh, he's not saved. He lost. You know? We're so, we're so quick to judge other people's salvations. But remember, you're not God. Now, we know the Bible, and we do know, according to the Bible and salvation, if somebody says, I reject Jesus Christ, I reject he died on the cross, I reject he rose again from the dead, we can say, according to that person's testimony of faith, they're not saved. But we have to be careful, on the other hand, of just being so judgmental of people if they don't just see everything the way we see it. These Judaizers says these people are not saved. So this created, look at the two words there. In verse 2, it says there was no, the two words there in verse 2 that begin with D. They created what? Dissension, Dissension and disputation. Dissension is insurrection. That's the one who committed sedition and insurrection and got himself arrested. So they're saying, th so basically this false doctrine created an uproar in the church. I mean, there was, there was a lot of emotion boiling over because an insurrection. This word is used in Acts 19 for the riot in Ephesus. So, what happened when these Judaizers were teaching this? Paul and Barnabas were upset. And then the church got into an uproar, into a confusion, almost into a riot. A riot of church. <laughs> you know, over the truth. So, Paul and Barnabas pushed push back. So, that's the one word, dissension. Disputation means a lot of questions and discussions. And look at verse 24. There's also an interesting... If you go down all the way in the passage, and what were these Judaizers doing in verse 24, where it says they, they caused trouble with their words? And then what does it say right after that in verse 24? What did they do? Subverting their souls. This doctrine literally was plundering people's souls, overthrowing their faith dismantling, taking apart the true gospel and trying to assemble adding circumcision to it. And so this was subverting souls. That's what false doctrine does. That's why doctrine is important. That's why we all need to know doctrine. That's why we have a doctrinal statement as well in, our, in the constitution of our church. So, so what does the church do? Look at verse 2 and 3, and here's what the whole church does together. It says, in verse 2, it says, they determined. And that word is literally ordained. They appointed. They, being who? The brethren in the church. The church appointed Paul and Barnabas and certain others to go to Jerusalem. So this is where the whole church comes together and says, we we got to get an answer to this. And it's causing a problem here. Let's go to another church where there are apostles there as well. And let's put all of our heads together and get the right answer to this attack against the gospel. So they appointed Paul and Barnabas. The church did. And then watch in verse 3 what it says. It says, and being brought on their way by the church. You know what that means? Who took care of the financial expense of the trip? The church did, being brought on their way. The church took, takes responsibility for their travel and perhaps for their protection in their travel, make sure that they got there safely. So again, we see the whole church involved in this decision and then in verse 4, when they got to the church of Jerusalem, and it says when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church. So the whole church of Jerusalem received them. 
So I really want us to see this, that it isn't just the apostles working this out. Now, Paul does say in Galatians chapter 2, talking about this, I most believe that, that it, when Paul's talking in Galatians chapter 2, why don't we go there, that he's talking about this very event of this Jerusalem council. And, and I want to be clear that I'm not saying that Paul did not meet privately with some of the other leaders in the church, because he did. And that also takes place in a church, where the leaders meet, perhaps privately, but when decisions are made, the whole church is involved. So that's what we see here in Galatians chapter 2, and it says in verse 1, and I'll just read this passage because it definitely connects to Acts 15. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation. So that's interesting. He went by revelation. That means God's told him to go, but the church appointed him to go. <laughs> so God works through the church. And it says, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by, we, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. So we weren't going to put up with that false teaching, not even for one hour. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So, you know, that's wisdom. He meets privately with the leaders of the church. They get their heads together, and then they go out publicly to the church and speak so that the whole church can come to a, a, a joint agreement. So that's what seems to have happened here. So how do we react when the gospel is under attack? Don't be intimidated. Know the truth of the gospel. Be assured, do you know the truth of the gospel? That it's that we're saved freely by the grace of Jesus Christ. And as we've often said, if you add one work to grace, it's no longer salvation by grace. <laughs> it's salvation by works. And so do not be intimidated, but know the truth of the gospel so that you do not compromise what is essential to our faith and to the salvation of souls. So knowing the tr truth is your and my responsibility jointly. And then maintain courage. Keep integrity. Transparency. That's how they deal with this problem. With integrity. Transparency. Humility. Paul spoke privately, but then publicly. Okay, the second thing is not only the dissension, but the discussion. So... Peter, Paul, and James all speak, and we'll just survey this. But Peter basically surveys what happened in the home of Cornelius, that God saved Gentiles, and the Holy Spirit filled them, and they spoke in tongues. And look what Peter says in Acts chapter 15, where Peter rose up, and he says in verse 8, Acts 15, 8, but, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving, uh, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, giving them the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit, even as he did to us. He gave the Holy Spirit to Gentiles in the house of Cornelius, just as he had to them on the day of Pentecost. And he put no difference between us and them, the them being the Gentiles, right? Purifying their hearts by faith. And look at what he says in verse 11. Let's all read that together. He says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. So Peter stands up and says, We're saved by grace. So Peter reviewed the past. And he says, It is the Lord's will that salvation is by grace through faith. And then Barnabas, Paul reports on the present, and 
And he is just in 1 verse 12, where he told the miracles and wonders God did. And then James Future, quoting from Amos, and kind of an obscure reference, quite frankly, that James stands up and quotes. And But basically he's saying that Jesus Christ is going to come again and establish his kingdom on earth. And there will be a temple built once again. And it will be Gentiles as a part of that kingdom. So let me read the passage. As James, this is the half-brother of Jesus, by the way. This is not James, the brother of John. How do I know that? He's dead. (laughs) James died in Acts chapter 12. So this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 15... Verse 15, he says, And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue, or that's the remnant of men, might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So, basically, James is saying as well that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the Gentiles. Okay, so that was their discussion. Peter reviewed the past. Paul reports on the present. James reflects on the future. And then we see finally their decision. And we see again that the whole church is involved in resolving this dispute. So let's just look at some of these verses. Go down, please, to Acts chapter 15. And verse number 22, it says, Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas and Silas. Okay, so watch this. Paul and Barnabas were sent by their church to the church in Jerusalem. The whole church sent Paul and Barnabas and others down. The whole church heard this discussion between Peter and Paul and James. Then they all come to an agreement. And now the whole church, the whole church of Jerusalem is going to send certain men back from their church to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So that when Paul and Barnabas, it's not going to be... Oh, they told us this and that and this. Well, how do we know they said that? We're, we're other witnesses. So there's witnesses. Not that they're not going to believe Paul and Barnabas, but you know what? You want to do things decently and in order, and you want to have witnesses, even if you're as honest as the Apostle Paul. You want to you want to have what you're saying be verified by witnesses, right? Does that make sense? So the whole church decides to send a man named Silvanus. You know who Silvanus is? Silas, who will then go with Paul on the next missionary journey. Remember, because he and Barnabas are going to have a dispute at the end of the chapter. So Silas is so Silas is actually from the Jerusalem church. He's going to go back and send by the church. So let me read it. It says, Then pleased with the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Bar- Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote a letter with them, the apostles and elders, brethren, send greetings unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria. Well, let's just read the letter that the apostles wrote and sent to the church from Jerusalem to Antioch. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barabbas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, men who have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So in other words, they're, they're going to verify what Paul and Barnabas are going to, what they've been saying all along. 
For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare ye well. And when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. They gathered, look again in verse 30, they gathered the whole multitude together. So again, the whole church, the whole multitude. Danielle, you're here. All right, school got out early, huh? The whole, they gathered the whole church together. Is it, this is important, I believe. How the whole church is involved in these things. Every member is important. And, and it says when they read, they rejoiced for the comfort, the consolation, the encouragement. This was encouraging to them. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren to the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. And God had that plan for Silas to go out with Paul on his next missionary journey. So the whole church was involved in resolving and in hearing and in agreeing and in rejoicing in the settling of this dispute. By the way, it says that these men, if you look at verse 22 and verse 25, there's actually a word. It says that the whole church sent Verse 22, what kind of men did they send? What does it say? Chosen. Elected. It's the word elected. So they had a vote. They voted. Chosen men. Also verse 25. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men. So that's twice in that passage. Okay, so the, the last thing I want to say, and this is actually going to open up a can of worms for my last five minutes or so. <laughs> is these four things that the church does tell the church of Antioch what they need to follow. And this is all, this has baffled me throughout my life. And you know what? It continues to baffle me. I've studied throughout the day this matter, these four things, and they're mentioned in verse 20. And I read verse 29 in the letter, but look at verse 20 different order but the same four things but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions to idols and in verse 29 it talks about meats offered to idols so it's that's the same thing meat that's been offered to idols pollution of idols from fornication from things strangled and from blood that's always baffled me for a number of reasons. One, how can we put fornication to eating something that's been strangled to death? <laughs> it seems to me that fornication is worse than that. So I was like, hmm, that's an interesting list of things that they're supposed to do. That's one. Another th the, the, so here's really the question that I have. The two big questions, maybe three is, are these moral, are all four of these things moral issues to which we're permanently bound? Are we permanently bound to not eat things strangled from blood, whatever that means? I'm not even sure, quite frankly. <laughs> so that's one, are, so are these permanently binding or are they cultural issues to which we have to exercise sensitivity with towards certain people that if we eat something strangled or eat meat sacrifice we we would uh, we would offend some people but for us it might not be so wrong so are these cultural issues at stake or are they moral issues at stake is that that's the question that i have or is it a combination does that make sense okay so that's why i'm confounded a bit mm -hmm. i'm gonna continue to be confounded you know why because i wasn't there mm -hmm. <laughs> and i don't understand enough about it i really I tried to figure out, I mean, I, I could probably spend a whole hour, and you don't want me to do that. I know, and I don't want to, I'll put you all right to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, but it goes back to Noah, when they weren't supposed to uh, eat, the, eat the blood. 
And did that talk about like literally in some in some that I read was so when it talks about blood, does it mean, for example, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Does it mean, for example, that you're out in the forest somewhere and you kill an animal and while it's still alive, you just cut some flesh off that animal and eat it while it's literally not cooked, while it's raw flesh, bloody meat, okay? Pagans do that. But I'm not sure what all of these things do mean, really, quite, quite frankly. Now, one, one thing that I read that I thought was sounded <clears throat> like a possibility, like a possibility. Okay, check this out. Someone said that all these four things are really not four things, but one thing. They're really just one thing, which is they were all common practices associated with idolatry. So things sacrificed to idols, fornication could be temple prostitution in, this, in that context, things strangled. Now, what's so wrong about eating something strangled? Because when you strangle something to death, where's all the blood? It's in the animal still. And blood quickly coagulates in animals. And, you know, eating and drinking that blood without sanitary conditions. I actually believe that God didn't want his people to do that for sanitation and for their health benefits. Um, but it, they were also a part of pagan, these were all part of pagan practices and pagan idolatry. Animals strangled during the worship of idols and then, and then just drinking the blood as it's in, in its coagulated state or whatever they do, or eating raw flesh while the animal was still alive and all of these things. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of questions here. Another thing that I read, and, and I, I don't know if this is true, but this is just, there's a, there's a lot of different possibilities here. So look at what it says. It says, I know I'm answering all your questions, right? I'm making this like, oh, wow, I, now I know what it means. Actually, you're, you're going to say, I don't know what that means, because I don't know what it means either. So, no, I'm just kidding. It says, verse 20, it says, but they, that, that we write unto you that they abstain from pollutions to idols. Now, we do know what that means. Paul wrote, and this is why I can't deal with it tonight, because Paul wrote chapters about that. First Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 and 10 about eating things sacrificed to idols. It's a huge subject, okay? That's why I said I'm opening up a can of worms. And from fornication. Now, some say that that fornication could just be Leviticus 18 and 19 and all of the commands against fornication in the, the Old Testament law. It could be that. It says, from things strangled. That is, again, eating animals that have just been strangled. You know why? What's kosher meat, by the way? You know what they do with kosher meat? They, they slice the animal to death at one of its main arteries. So that while the blood is still beating, it pumps all the blood out of the body through those major arteries. That's what makes it kosher. So it, it, that's how it gets rid of the blood. If you strangle something, all the blood is still in the body. And even if you turn that animal upside down, the blood coagulates and it's still in there. And somebody even said, if I could find this, that... When, oh yeah, here it says strangulation could pop blood vessels and then deposit the blood into the meat tissue as well. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. So anyway, uh, there's different things here. Now, one thing I wanted to say here, and I'm, I'll be done, is it says, and from blood. Now, is that the drinking of the blood? Somebody suggested it's the shedding of blood, obviously like murder. Of course, you're not supposed to kill people, you know. So what exactly these things mean? It's very difficult for us to sit here and really say 100% this is what we understand this to mean. But this is the point. To summarize, each congregation, the Church of Antioch and the Church of Jerusalem, took responsibility. The Church of Antioch took responsibility to no sound doctrine and the truth of the gospel. 
the Church of Jerusalem took responsibility to fix the problem that they in some ways had caused. It says, sorry about that, guys. We That these guys went and they taught. We didn't tell them to teach that, right? So everybody takes responsibility. When there's doctrinal dispute, listen and learn and love. Don't compromise the gospel. But again, some believe with these high stakes that there are might be that what that we do have freedom in Christ and because of the tensions of Jewish people coming out of the law what aspects of the law to let go so there was some maybe cultural compromise between the Gentiles and the Jewish people and they say for the Gentiles just do these things not to offend the conscience of the Jewish people so as we close go to first Corinthians I just want to read two scriptures there chapter 8 go to first chapter 8 verse 10 the last verse of first Corinthians chapter 8 actually verse 13 first Corinthians chapter 8 verse 13 and it says wherefore if meat make my brother to offend I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. So liberty isn't doing what I want. Liberty might be curtailing what I want for the sake of the gospel. So that's one thing. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I, I want to just say one other thing on this. Because I find this dispute very, it's very interesting to me. I'm very in intrigued by it. But what I think is also interesting, especially in light of how the Catholic Church puts itself above every church, and you know the Pope is above every other priest that kind of thing that here you have the Apostles on earth here you have the Church of Jerusalem which was the first church on earth and yet they were in error so to speak in allowing these teachers to leave their church and go to the Church of Antioch and the Church of Antioch was not under the Church of Jerusalem and the Church of Jerusalem was not under the Church of Antioch they were both functioning as local churches under the headship of Jesus Christ. So that's what we believe is Baptist, what we see right here. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And let's stand together as we read this. And I hope I didn't confuse you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God even as I please all men in all things not seeking mine own profit but the profit of many that they may be saved and I believe that's what the apostles and the leaders in these churches were driving at not to do anything that would offend that would close somebody's mind from the truth of the gospel the truth of the gospel is always at stake let's pray